imagine, imagine um, it's the beginning of the school year and your daughter comes home and says to you, Ima, I love my new teacher. I, I have a science teacher. He, he's the greatest teacher ever. I love my new teacher. And you're all so happy, like your, your daughter's happy. And you say, why? And she says, because he said there's going to be no tests. <laughs> there's no tests. He is moonlighting at a community college, and he has no time to grade all the papers. So there's going to be no tests. I love my new teacher. He's the greatest teacher ever. And what are you thinking? as you're calling up the school to get this guy fired. This is the worst teacher ever. Why? Anybody here a teacher? Teachers? Teachers. What do you teach? Math. Math. So, <laughs> math. <laughs> it brings back bad memories, I'm sorry. All right, so imagine, imagine, oh no, so obviously you give tests, right? You give tests? Okay, so why are you giving your kids the test? How old are these kids? High school. High school? Okay, perfect. So how, so why, why are you testing them? They won't remember it otherwise unless they review it. Right, to force them to review so they'll remember. What's your goal in the year? What's your goal? Uh, so they my goal to challenge them, to teach them to become motivated, and um, to give them study skills. Okay, great. So she wants them to realize their potential and to get all the skills that they need to realize their potential in this, this subject, in math. You know, math, you know, some of my kids got my husband's math gene. He's like a walking calculator. And some of them got my math gene. Poor things, all right? Uh, but I, I tell my daughter, who's like, oh, you know, they always say in math, like, they're, they're always saying, okay, this, this doesn't apply to me. Algebra, who cares? I go, shopping is math, okay? Cooking is math. One third, you double the recipe. Like, there are practical applications to this. All right. So that's what your motivation is. That's what you're thinking. I'm giving the test because I care about these kids. I want them to get the right skills. I want to know if I'm teaching properly, right? They're absorbing the material. And her goal is that they should realize their potential in this subject. What are the kids thinking when you announce the test? Thank you so much for caring about me so much. That's not what they're thinking. They're thinking, oh, like the, she gets off on giving us pain, I can't wait the subject to be over, another test, I can't believe it, they just they don't even care about, they're thinking the opposite. So too with the Almighty. The Almighty is sending us tasks because he cares. And he wants us to realize our potential in what subject? The subject of? Life. 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 But when the test comes, are we thinking, thank you so much. My creator, who cares and loves me so much, brought me this challenge and this test. Is that what we're thinking? No. No. We're pointing fingers, blaming other people around us, complaining, woe is me, feeling sorry for ourselves. Everything happens to me. You're pointing fingers instead of turning it around and realizing that this is a test between me and my creator. And the Almighty sent me this test because he loves me and he wants me to be great. When you realize it's a test, it's 90% towards passing the test. You already got a 90 if you just realize that this is a test. Instead of blaming and complaining and pointing fingers. How do you know that something is a test from God? How do you know it's a test? You know it's a test because it's hard. And what's hard for you is not hard for me. And what's hard for me is not necessarily hard for you. But if it's hard for you, it's a test. So 90% towards passing the test is just realizing it's a test. How do you know it's a test? Because it's hard. The next 5% is realizing what category of test it falls under. The next 5% is just following through based on it. So most of it is just realizing it's a test, all right? So I'm going to um, walk you through the different categories of tests. And there's an acronym with it so you can remember it. Because when you're in the middle of a test, you're not going to call it, don't call me because I never answer my phone. And you're not going to have your notes with you. And I'm telling you, this wisdom works. 
It's life-changing wisdom. I adapted this from something I learned from Sar Yocheved Rigler, who learned it from Rabbi Leib Kellerman, and I've adapted it and put it into a form that people hopefully can be able to access so easily. The acronym is GCAM, G-C-A-M, like God's camera. God's sending you a task, and he's waiting to see if you pass. And why is the Almighty sending us a task? Because he cares. That teacher, that science teacher, doesn't care. The, if a teacher cares, the teacher will give tasks. Because my kid who came home on the first day and said, I love my science teacher because my science teacher doesn't give tasks, how, how is she going to do that year? How, is she going to learn anything? Is she going to try? Is she going to make any effort at all? No. Think of... Uh, a test that you went through in life. Something hard. You got it? If somebody would have said to you before you went through it, this is what you're going to go through, what would you have said to them? No way. No, 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 no. That I couldn't handle. Not that. But guess what? You did. You're sitting here as testimony to the fact that somehow you did handle it. And I would put money on it that you became a very different person because you passed that test, because you got through it. All these women who come on our trips, this Jewish Women's Renaissance Project that I have, this Birthright for Mothers. So this year we had 1,200 women from 15 different countries. And next year, I'm actually, one of the reasons I'm here is we're signing a contract with the Israeli government because they want to double our numbers next year because they came to us, they saw what we were doing and it's really a tremendous thing. And some of these women, a lot of people ask me, oh, do you get to know all the women? On the no, <laughs> I can barely remember my kids' names, let alone these women's <laughs> names, all right? So I don't get, but who do I do? I do get to know a handful. Who do I get to know? The, the hard cases. The women who are really going through heavy stuff because the women who come, they, we partner with organizations around the world in order to do this. And these organizations are recruiting the women and they're staffing the buses. And I tell them, we call them city leaders, the, uh, often they're, they're rabbis' wives or they're educators who come on the trip to lead the women. <laughs> and I say to them, you are the first line of defense. If a woman is having an issue with her roommate or she misses her kids or she's struggling in her marriage or whatever it is that she's dealing with, you're the first line of defense, you handle it. But if you can't handle it or you feel I would be better, then send her to me. That's what I'm here for. So the women I get to know are the women who have been through a lot of stuff or going through something very heavy. And just when you think you've heard it all, you haven't heard it all. Professional Jewish women, you can't even imagine what's going on in their lives. You can't even imagine. So, one, so I do it my best to try to help them. But sometimes it's a situation where you just, no matter what you say, you're not, you're not going to be of any help. But one thing I do tell them, and I really, I, I'm telling you, I, I see it and I believe it, that people who go through stuff become people of substance. And people who have gone through stuff, they have a little bit of disdain for people who are complaining that the throw pillow came back with the wrong fabric. And that's the worst thing that's going on in their lives. Really? When you, become, when you go through heavy things, you become a heavier person. And you see life in a heavier way, in a deeper way. I wish it was that we grew tremendously when everything is going great. You're just clinging to the Almighty. You're just really growing as a person, going up that ladder of potential. I wish it was true. But in general, we grow when it's hard, when you're tested. <laughs> And when I said to you to think of something that you went through and you didn't think that you had it in you, guess what? You had it in you. You reached down and you found some, something with inside you and the support of the people around you that got you through it. That's pretty amazing. Now, we don't want it to be that we cling to God only when times are tough, but it is human nature. So GCAM, God's camera, that's our acronym because there's four different categories of tests. Remember, most of passing the test is just realizing it's a test. The next 5% is what category does it fall under? So I'm gonna go through all four categories and each category comes with a choice, this or that. 
The first category is giver versus taker. Giver versus taker. Here's the scenario, and try to be honest, all right? You know somebody in the community, and you don't really get along. You had a falling out, all right? This is not your favorite person. Somebody who knows both of you calls you up and says that that woman that you don't really get along with had to leave the country, go abroad for medical tests. And the test came back. It wasn't good news. She's going to have to stay for an extended period of time abroad. So we're all getting, and she has to give up her apartment. So we're all getting together this Sunday, and we are going to pack up her stuff. Are you in? So for those of you who said, I'm in, this is not a test. This is not hard. I'm in. I'm in. For those of you who said, I'm not in, it's also not a test. I'm not in. For those in between, it's a test. I, didn't, I don't really want to spend the day packing up this woman's stuff. I had other plans. Imagine your daughter was, let's make it, because Sunday's not really a, a good day here in terms of using the scenario, let's, let's make it an Arab Shabbat, okay? So it's Arab Shabbos, it's Friday, all right? Okay, so now, now it's becoming a test, okay? People are switching sides already, okay? <laughs> okay, it's Arab Shabbos, and um, you had told your daughter, your daughter was having a, a little bit of a tough week, you told your daughter, you know what? I'm going to make sure Shabbos is ready. Arab Shabbos, it's you and me. A little TLC day, all right? We're going to, just you and Ima, we're going to go out, we're going to go shopping. We're just, you know your, your daughter needs special time. <coughs> if you choose to spend the day with your daughter and not packing up this woman's stuff, are you choosing to be a taker? No, you're choosing to be, choosing to be a giver to your daughter. But imagine you were having a hard week. And you decided, you know what, Erev Shabbos, I'm going to make sure Shabbos is ready. And Erev Shabbat, I'm going to get my nails done. I'm going to have a TLC day because if I'm not for myself, who am I for? Okay, got it? All right, so now you get the call about packing up this woman's stuff. Now it's getting a little, a little murky, all right? Do you hear? Even with your daughter, because you don't want to go spend the day packing up this woman's stuff, but even with your daughter, you're choosing to be a giver with your daughter, but maybe for, for 45 minutes. That day, you and your daughter could go over and you're doing chesed together. Do you understand? Imagine you are chairing the school fundraiser. And you have very important meetings you're setting up because there's going to be a Malava Malka. And Erev Shabbos, you're going to be setting everything up. And you're in charge. Can you pack up this woman's stuff? No. No, it's not a task. You can't go. But imagine you are going, you're planning to uh, just be another volunteer at the fundraiser and you know contribute financially to it. So you could send your check in. You could spend time. Do you see how things and how easy it is to rationalize our choices? And life is choice. You made a thousand choices today. Should I get up? Should I sleep in? Should I wear this, eat this, be with this person, do this? It, life is choice. So when it says in the Torah to make a choice, we're supposed to choose what? We're supposed to choose life. What does that mean? Choose to breathe? No, choose life. Choose awareness. Choose understanding. Choose to question. Choose to strive. Be alive. Eternal. Choose life. Make choices that are only that are going to change your life here and in the world to come. Choose life. So when you're faced with a choice, again, and the choice is a test, and you know it's a test because it's hard, so the first option is giver versus taker. Now, when you make a choice, and you have to be real with it, and you know it's hard and this is a task, you have to stop and say out loud, this is a test. This is a test sent to me by God because he loves me and he wants me to be great. I recognize it's a task and I choose to be a giver. It's very hard to say the word taker. But sometimes you have to say it. I choose to be a taker. If you choose to be a taker, in the ladder of your potential, you're going down. 
but there are times we go down. Because sometimes it's three steps up and two steps down, but at least you're up a step. But just know you're going down. But going down doesn't mean you should let go of the ladder and fall into a black hole and an abyss. No, you made a mistake and then you get back on track. But at least know you made a mistake. I tell my kids, everybody makes mistakes. Look, look in the Tanakh, okay? It's filled with people making mistakes. What you do with that mistake is the test of who you are. Do you grow from that mistake? Do you make good? Do you become a better person? Do you, or does it become, define you and you go down and then you label yourself and all the bad things that can happen from there? But I tell them, if you make a mistake, at least know you made a mistake. Don't rationalize that it's not a mistake. You blew it. At least know it. The author of my last, my co-author of my last book, um, his name is Bob Berg. He's like the Zig Ziglar motivational speaker, and he has all the lines. He says, "Rational lies are rational lies." <laughs> so be careful not to rationalize your life away, and we do it because nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to do the wrong thing today. I'm going to make poor choices today. This was, no. We all rationalize why this was the right thing. And you can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool the Almighty. All right, so first one is giver versus taker. The second of GCAM, C, is connection versus estrangement. Connection versus estrangement. My, by my reacting, what I say, how I say it, when I say it, is either going to bring me closer to this person or far away. When it's a test between you and your husband, you never have to wonder, what category is this? It's always this category. Always. When it's a test between you and one of your children, you never have to wonder, what category is this? It's always this category. When it's between you and your siblings or friends, 60% of the time it's this category. When it's between you and your parents, 40% of the time it's this category. This is either going to bring me closer or far away. When, it comes between, when it's between you and other people, for sure with our spouse and for sure with our children, there are no neutral interactions. There's no par of interactions. Either this is being interpreted by the person as positive or negative. Either this makes them feel closer to you or farther apart. There is no neutral. You think that it's just constructive to remind your husband to take out the garbage. Right? It's par. It's not positive, it's not negative. You're just sharing information and reminding him nicely. How is he interpreting it? Nagging. You're nagging. You're, it's negative. You're just reminding your child to put their backpack away or to do their homework. This is, just, this is constructive information. But how are they interpreting it? As negative. There are no neutral interactions. Things that you think are simple and nothing are something. Everything is something. So let me give you an example. I'll, let me give you the example that Saria Hevedrigo gave publicly. This is a great example. She said that um, one night her husband said to her, Honey, do you want to go out for dinner? She's like, Great. And they live in the old city of Jerusalem. They came into town and now they're having dinner. And he said to her over dinner, I have to tell you something. She says, What? He says, remember Cousin Deadbeat? Well, he came to me last year to co-sign on a Gemach loan. And he didn't pay it back. So you know the $2,000 we've been saving up for a family vacation in Netanya? We have to give it to the Gemach. If you're the wife at this point and you have to react, is this a test? No, I was teaching this in Washington, D.C., where I live. And there was somebody sitting to my left who's very wealthy. And I said, is this a test? She goes, no. I go, let's add a few zeros. <laughs> it's $200,000. She goes, now it's a test. Okay. I was teaching here some cola wives. They're like, $200 is a test, okay? 
So whether you have to add zeros or take away zeros, for most women, your husband didn't ask you. He, he, he co-signed on a gamak loan to, to a deadbeat cousin, and now all the money you've been saving up for vacation, we're going to give to the gamak? For most women, this is a test. How do you know it's a test? Because it's hard. <laughs> do you know what she said to him? I have to leave the table for a few minutes. <laughs> she leaves the table, she goes out into the Jerusalem night. And she says out loud, this is a test. This is a test sent to me by Hashem because he loves me and he wants me to be great. I recognize it's a test. And uh, she says it took her five minutes to say, and I choose connection. She went back to the table and said to him, clearly, I would have preferred if you had come to me before you did this, but we're, we're in this together and we're going to get through this together. She said it's been six months and they've never come for the money. Why? Because it has nothing to do with the money. It has nothing to do with her husband. It has nothing to do with the cousin deadbeat. It has nothing to do with the gamach. This was a test between her and Hashem. And once you pass the test, often it goes away. Because the reason the Almighty sent you the test was to make you a greater person. And once you become a greater person, not always, but often, I have seen it, it goes away. There's a couple that we know. We live uh, in suburban Washington, D.C. in Rockville, Maryland. And there's a couple that we know there. She started coming to my classes and she started getting excited about her Judaism. And she brought it home to her husband. Her husband was like, no way, Jose. Okay, this man was not moving, Jewishly. And I coached her and she sort of brought him along, brought him along. And he was one of those guys that, you know, he would say, absolutely not, we're not keeping kosher. And once we got him over that line, then he'd become like the poster boy for kosher. Everybody's a big kosher, okay? So, but everything was like that. Coming to shul, Shabbat, everything was like that. And they got to the point where I said to her, listen, you, you gotta move. You gotta move, because they were basically Shomer Shabbos at this point, except they were driving to shul because they lived outside the neighborhood. So uh, she comes home and she tells her husband, <laughs> we gotta move. And he's like, that's it, that's my line, no way, okay? Okay, let's stop talking to Lori. <laughs> so some of the husbands, you know, after the trip, I'll go to the cities and countries where the women are from, and I meet the husbands. And sometimes the husbands are like, oh, you're Lori. And some of them are like, oh, you're Lori. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, so, so she, I coached her, and she got him to the point where he's like, fine, okay, fine, They're, they're going to move. So every Sunday, they would drive around the neighborhood, going to open houses, looking for a house. And week after week after week, there was never a house. He was like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This one's too big, this one's too small. This one, the den is on this side, I want it to be on that side. There was always something. She's just like, just buy a house already. And she was really getting upset. So I learned this wisdom. I came back from, from Israel, and I sat down with her, and I shared it with her. The next Sunday, she sends me a text message. She says, we're outside another house. And this one's to whatever. And she wrote, I choose connection. And the next week he bought a house. And they're pillars of our community. Like it changed their whole life. They went on to have more children. It's like unbelievable. Amazing. Why? Because it had nothing to do with the real estate market. It had nothing to do with her husband's pickiness. It, it was the test between her and God. And once she passed the test and spoke to him in a different way, and reacted in a different way, and realized that, oh my gosh, he's just being sent by Hashem as, as my task so that I'll become a better person, the test went away. My husband, uh, I fly, people often ask me, like, do you like living in Washington? And, and the best part about living in that area is there's three airports, because I'm always somewhere. And, uh, and I, I wasn't like, you know, my kids were little, I was at home with them, but they're, they're grown now, and I have lots of options, okay? So three airports means lots of options, I can fly into this one, that one. So one time my husband offered to drive me to the airport. Sometimes I get a car service, and sometimes uh, he'll drive me. So it's great, so now we're driving, and my husband decided that day to use a different route. Okay, we were in the worst DC traffic. I, I, it was unbelievable, and I'm looking at my watch, and I'm gonna miss my plane, and I'm the speaker. 
at an event. I'm the only speaker at this event, and I'm freaking out. And he knows I'm freaking out, and things started getting tense between us, and we started getting into a fight. I'm like, well, why did you, why did you go a different way? Don't you, this is rush hour traffic, why did you go through DC, blah, 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 blah. And we're fighting, we're fighting, fighting, and I realize as we're fighting, oh my gosh, this is a test. Because <laughs> this is hard. Because I was phoning, and there was no other flights afterwards. Like this, this. So while we're fighting, under my breath, I'm like, this is a test, this is a test, not to be from Hashem, because he wants me to love, wants me to be great. I choose connection. <sighs> and I said to him, listen, just drive carefully. Everything's gums of the everything's for the good. It should be the, if I miss the, the plane, obviously I wasn't meant to go, and it should be the worst thing that ever happens to us. We get to the airport. I run out of the car, I run through the airport, okay? It's unbelievable, I got, I got on the plane. I'm like huffing and puffing, I, I call my husband, I said, I got on the plane. He didn't even leave the airport because there was no way I was gonna make this plane. He was just waiting to take me back. <laughs> because when you pass the test, often it goes away. You got it? All right, so that's connection versus estrangement. And again, every interaction you have, for sure, with almost everybody in your life, but for sure with your spouse and for sure with your children, is either going to bring you closer or farther away. And it's your choice. It doesn't mean that everything they do is fine and you just let it slide. No, but the way you say things, the timing of how you say it, you're either building them and bringing, your, bringing you closer or you are breaking them down and farther away. It's your choice which is very empowering. Because you can't change people, you can only change your reaction to them. And once you change your reaction to them, that often creates an environment where they can change. The next category A of GCAM is acceptance versus rejection. Acceptance versus rejection. Either I accept that this is from God, and somehow this is for my good, and this is my opportunity to grow, or I reject it and I'm pointing fingers and being upset and mad and freaking out. You think your situation is creating your emotional reality. Well, this is going on in my life. That's why I'm upset or depressed or angry or fill in the blank. It's actually not. It's actually your thoughts. I'll give you an example. Imagine there's a trauma in a family, God forbid. There's a divorce, four kids. One grows up and says, I will never marry. The second one grows up, decides to become a marriage counselor to help people in their marriages. The third one grows up and is determined to have the greatest marriage ever. Do you understand? You have four different kids and each one can have a completely different reaction, not just because they're different people. It's the same situation. It's what their thoughts were. Because you can't control the situation, but you can control your thoughts. It's really an amazing thing. When something is happening, if you're freaking out, the, where, where does the Almighty want you to live? In what emotional space does he want you to live? He wants you to be, it's called Yeshuva Das, which means a settled mind. Because when things are going on in your life and they're heavy things, nobody expects you and God doesn't expect you to walk around so happy. Oh, look at the bright side. You know what? This is heavy. There is no bright side. Every cloud has a silver lining. Really? all the crazy and stupid things that people say to you that do not help you or comfort you or support you. <laughs> it's not happy, it's Yeshuva Das, a settled mind. What does that mean? The three C's, calm, clear, connected. When you're calm, clear, and connected, that's the space that the Almighty wants you to live in. Are you gonna make good choices when you're freaking out, upset, angry, Guilty, regretful, revengeful. Are you going to make good choices? No. When you're in that state of whether it's depression or anxiety or worry or fear, don't make a choice. That's the, that's the Almighty's message to you. Your thoughts are wrong. Don't make a choice. Don't make a significant purchase. Don't have a significant conversation. Don't click send on the email. There's something that Gmail has called uh, undo. 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 The greatest thing ever, okay? You should sign up for it. It's called undo. So when I send an email, this thing pops up and it says, do you want to undo this? You literally have three seconds to decide. And sometimes I do, I undo. I shouldn't send it. 
or I see there was a spelling error or something, or, or I forgot something. <laughs> but it just, years ago, my husband and I were living in Denver, Colorado. And we had a radio show on Sunday morning called The Palatniks. And I have a little bit of background in radio. My husband didn't. And when we were being trained on the board, it was like a call-in show. And it wasn't a Jewish show, but it was clear we were Jewish. Because I'd say, Rabbi, what do you think of that? And we'd have different topics and, and values and wisdom that applies to you know, Jews and non-Jews alike. So we were being trained on the, on the, on the board. I remember in the studio, uh, they said to us, OK, so this is the button where you take the calls, and this is the volume, and they're showing us all the things. And they go, and then this is the most important button. It's the eight second delay button. When you hear something on the radio, it actually happened eight seconds ago. There's an eight second delay. So they said, if somebody calls up and says something they shouldn't have said, uses a bad word, hit the button, and the last eight seconds will never be heard. And they said, if you say something, right, and you regret it, hit the button, and the last eight seconds will never be heard. So what was I thinking? I wish I had this button in my life. <laughs> eight seconds, eight minutes, eight days, eight years. When you're in a state and you're freaking out, anxiety, worry, fear, depression, and anybody would say to you, of course you should feel that way because this is what's going on in your life, but if you're in that state, don't click send on that email. You're gonna say things that you regret. Wait for Yeshua Das. How do you get there? Don't replace your thoughts that are filled with all of these, all, all, the, all the, the, the worry, the fear, and anxiety. Don't replace them with happy thoughts. You're just masking that, and now we've got a bunch of jumbled up thoughts. No. Let the thoughts go. Just let them go. And wait for the three C's, clear, calm, and connected. What does that mean, let them go? Where is, according to the, st the studies, where, what is the number one place that we get that eureka moment? I got it. You got the answer to, to whatever thing you've been struggling with. Where's the number one place? Shower. The shower, exactly. The shower. Why the shower? Because you're not thinking. Like what happens is we overthink things. We think, we think, we overthink, we analyze, we, 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 and we make ourselves nuts. When you clear your head, Wisdom comes. You have inner wisdom. The Almighty gave it to you, came built in with the factory, from the factory. It's your neshama. It's your GPS, your God positioning system. The Almighty is always trying to help you to turn left or right and make the right turns in life. But we're not listening, why? Because there's so much noise going on in our head. We're so distracted. We're so obsessing. Clear your head and wisdom will come. Where's the number two place that people get the eureka moment? No, it's ironing. Ironing. That's why your maid is a lot happier than you are, okay? <laughs> so we won't go there, we'll just stick with showering, all right? You clear your head. Now, whatever works, works, all right? For some people, you do, you sleep on it. You sleep on it and then you wake up with the answer. For some people, you know, you know, one of the worst pieces of marital advice is, I'm sorry if this is your marital advice, and, or if you love this, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to insult you, but I think it's a ter terrible advice, is never go to sleep angry. Did you ever hear this? Yes. So you stay up, and you make your husband stay up, you fight to the death because you can't go to sleep angry. You know what? Sometimes it's better to go to sleep angry, and you wake up, you're not so angry anymore, okay? <laughs> My husband, this is part of a different talk on marriage, but my husband has a 24-hour rule in our marriage. And I didn't know, seriously, for like the first 20 years of our marriage that he had this rule, all right? He's, he, the 24-hour rule is that if I do something that upsets him, which has happened twice, okay? If I do something that upsets him, he waits 24 hours before bringing it up. Why? Because 24 hours later, most of the time, he doesn't even remember. And when he teaches this to men, he tells them to use this tool, the guys get angry. They're like, I have to tell her right away because then I'll forget. <laughs> they're, and they're serious, okay? They really mean it. And we know if you forgot, then it wasn't that important. It's not worth being upset about. It's not worth even bringing up. But if 24 hours later you remember, 
Now you're not, you can talk it out, but now you're not so angry anymore. Clear, calm, and connected. So for some people, you sleep on it. For some people, it's yoga. For some people, it's, it's, it's prayer. For some people, I know somebody, she says when she gets, when she's freaking out, she realizes, okay, my thoughts are wrong. She takes her thoughts in her mind. She actually she personifies them and, and uh, she puts them into a balloon and she lets it go, a helium balloon. So in her mind, she just lets it go. You just let it go and let it flow. And I'm telling you, wisdom will come. Think about something that's going on in your life right now. Right now, okay? If somebody, a friend of yours, came to you, imagine this wasn't going on in your life, it was going on in her life, and she came to you for advice, you would have really good advice for her. But we can't see it for ourselves because there's so much noise. When I learned this, I applied it. My, my daughter, uh, she was writing finals, and she was in New York, and she's on the phone with me, freaking out. I can't do it. There's too much work. I'm going to flunk out. I'm not going to get it. I, I, I'm, I'm going to give up the degree. I'm really sorry, but I can't do it. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. And she's like freaking out. And I said, Shoshana, take a breath. I said, if your, do if your roommate, Rebecca, came to you, with the say and said exactly what you said to me, what would you tell her? She goes, Ema, you're not listening to me. It's too much work, I can't do it, I can't do this, there's no way, that's why. Oh, Shoshana, if Rebecca came to you and said the exact same thing to you, what would you say to her? She said, I would tell her, don't freak out, divide up the material, do a little bit every day, you'll be fine. I said, I think that's good advice. <laughs> We really can help other people because the noise is not there. You have wisdom. The Almighty does not send us a test that we can't pass. You think you can't pass it, but you can. And one way to know that is to think, oh, if my friend came to me with the same situation, try to be objective, you would have great advice for her. You really would. All right. So acceptance versus rejection is not easy. Imagine whoever's hiring, who, whoever is handling your finances calls you up and tells you that your 401k is now a 201k. For most people, it's hard. Uh, we just did this whole thing, buying a place in Eretz Israel, all right? And buying and selling here is not easy, okay? <laughs> so, we were going through it because we had bought a place in Beitar many years ago. We never, you know, it's so funny. We bought a place, we sold our house in, just between us, we sold our house in Toronto, okay? And we, uh, when we moved to the States, and we had a little bit of money. And normally we live month to month, no matter how our life goes. This is the way the Almighty likes us to live. It's good for us, clearly. And I took, we took this money, and we ended up putting down, uh, because it was our dream to own a place in there as well, and we bought a place in Beitar. Why? Because our friends had just bought a place in Beitar. And we were very close with them, and so we bought in the same building, which is being built. We bought it from a fax plan, all right? We put money down, fine. So time goes on, and uh, we rented it out. We had tenants there, and the tenants were paying down the mortgage, which was very nice, but nice of them. And time goes on. I remember saying to my friend, am I going to fit into Big Tar? She goes, absolutely not. OK, fine. <laughs> so, uh, but not just that. But listen, if you're a young Haredi family, and you have little kids, and it's a very beautiful place to live, but my kids aren't little anymore, okay? They grew up, and my work uh, for the Jewish Women's Renaissance Project is very much centered in this area. They stay at the King Solomon. They, have, they go to the H uh, building for, for classes. So my life is very much central here, and it just would not work. So uh, our daughter had made Aliyah, and our son had, uh, he went to, he served in the army. He, would, he went to Nachal Haredi. And so we had kids here. We needed a place for them, and all this thing. So we decided, um, recently to sell in Beitar and to buy in an area called Muswara. You know Muswara? It's just behind City Hall. It's off of Shifti Israel. Okay? Um, it's not a place you would raise little kids in. It's a little bit of a sketchy place. But it's, it's sort of turning over and becoming a, a, you know, more safer and nicer and it's very central and they have like, it kind of feels like an old city apartment but it's not in the old city. Okay, so, but buying and selling was really, really hard. I'm telling you, 
It, it's unbelievable what we went through. And it was so bizarre to us because the system here is not like the system in the United States. The United States is you close and then everybody gets their money. But not here. You have to give money along the way. And you haven't sold yet. And so you have no money. So you're trying to buy something with nothing. And it was very, and they kept saying like all these crazy taxes and these things and, and something that you have to decide and sign on. But then later on, you find out from City Hall. But you can't, until you sign, you don't know from City Hall who owes that money. And I'm like, I don't, and every time I get frustrated, my husband goes, you don't understand our country, OK? So it was really very, very, and so, but then I realized that the Talmud says that there are three things that take pain in acquiring. You know this, right? There's three things that take pain in acquiring. So one, one is Torah. OK, if you really want life wisdom, it's going to take a little bit of pain, right, to, to grow and to face it. And the second is Olam Haba. You really want eternity. It's going to take some pain. And Eretz Yisrael. So I said, we're doing the third one. <laughs> we are totally doing the third one, all right? So at one point, it was like they, they said that the city hall, apparently our mortgage broker said, city hall says that your apartment is not this big. It's this big. Because when it became this big, it was before the state of Israel existed. So there's no record of it. And so they can only give us a mortgage for this big. So my husband, so we had to put in, we had to borrow against my life insurance and, and money we had put aside for our weddings and put it into this apartment. And so I told my kids, OK, new plan. Nobody gets married, nobody dies, OK? <laughs> for now, <laughs> just on hold for now. We're on pause right now, OK? It was crazy, crazy, crazy. But Baruch Hashem, um, on Arab Shabbos, we, we were handed the key, and everything, everything is good. Yeah, I'm so, so happy. Couldn't be happier. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. And uh, I, most of you, I think, live here. I think you do. And I don't, we don't have the, and people think I live here because of the video blog. And I'm here all the time because of the trips. But we really don't, we don't have the, we don't have the Swasiata, the merit to live here because the land keeps spitting us out and whatever we're doing there. But our kids slowly, slowly are coming here because somebody told me, if you can't live there, send them ahead. All right? Just send your kids ahead. But now having this, I hope, please God, one day to, to be here full time. All right. So if it's a financial thing, it's hard. It's a task. And at one point, I was getting angry. Right? Who am I getting angry at? Sometimes I'm getting angry with my husband. You know, maybe he should have known. Or I'm getting angry with the mortgage broker. I'm getting angry with the system. But in the end, I realize it's just a test. <coughs> it's a test. So when it's financial, is this a test between, is this giver versus taker to your stockbroker? No. Is this connection versus estrangement to your stockbroker? No. This is acceptance versus rejection. Either I accept that the situation is from the Almighty and act accordingly, or I reject it. If I reject it, there's anger, fear, worry, anxiety, uh, uh, depression, and, and revenge. But if I accept it, it's still not easy. But hopefully you're getting to a place where you realize if I accept it, what? Well, this is a test from the Almighty. This is a test because he loves me and he wants me to be great. I recognize it's a test, test and I choose, in this case, acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean I go to bed and I pull the covers over my head till it goes away. You have to make a decision. You have to put your effort in. Imagine you get a call from the, your doctor, and God forbid, it's not good news. Is this a test? Is this a test? Is this giver versus taker to your doctor? No. Is this connection versus estrangement? No. This is acceptance versus rejection. Either I accept this is from the Almighty or I reject it. And again, accepting it means you must make decisions. You have to make choices. You have to, but don't do it in a state when you're freaking out. Wait for clear, calm, connected. Yeshuva does. A settled mind. All right. Giver versus taker, connection versus estrangement, acceptance versus rejection. The last one of GCAM, God's camera. M. M is my will versus God's will. My will versus God's will. This usually has to do with um, taking on a mitzvah, our level of observance, where we are in the ladder in terms of our own Jewish journey. So let me give you two examples from two different worlds. So let's do the world that I live in mostly, which is dealing with the secular world. The, I tell the women who come to my classes, especially around Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur time, this is a good time of year to take on a mitzvah. And this applies to us too, because nobody does it all, right? There's, 
There's, uh, there's, there's doing the mitzvah in a better way. There's taking on a mitzvah you know you should be doing, all right? And the Jewish year is not a cycle. Whoa, it just seemed like it was just Hanukkah yesterday, and it was. So it's not a cycle, it's a spiral. You're going around, but hopefully from year to year, you're going up. And again, sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps back, but at least you're up. So if you take on another mitzvah every year, this is a very good thing. I tell them you should take on one individually, and one as a family. So she go up the ladder for, for yourself, and as a family, we're also going to embrace something. All right, and that's a good thing to do for everyone. So imagine my, the women in my class take this seriously, and they do. I say, okay, so, so that, let's say they've decided, okay, listen, I'm not gonna be totally Shomer Shabbat. I'm not gonna be totally, totally, totally Shomer Shabbos, but Friday night's gonna be sacred. I'm gonna turn Friday night into Shabbat. And we're gonna disconnect in order to connect. We're going to disconnect and unplug all the iPhones, the iPads, the IIIs, all right? And we're going to connect. So the first Friday night, that's what happens, right? The kids are like, what's going on, whatever, whatever, but she makes all their favorite food and it's kind of nice, okay. The next Shabbat, right, she lights candles on time, she, her husband's making kiddush, all right? They invite some friends over. The next Shabbat, he's giving a Devar Torah, she made challah with the kids that week. This is great, okay? That Sunday, she gets a call from a friend. Her friend says, you know how all the girl cousins in my family, how, how once a year we take a girl cousin trip? Well, this year we're going to Las Vegas. But well, one of my cousins had to drop out at the last minute. And she can't get her money back, but she can just give it to somebody else. And she's willing to give it free to someone else. And you're the someone else. And you're going to come with us. And everything's included. All the meals, all the shows, everything. We leave Friday night, 8 o'clock. Are you in? Are you in? Okay, so for most of the people in this room, I would say all the people in this room, is this a test? No. This is not a test. At a certain point in my Jewish journey, this would have been a test. But now, I don't care what you offer me, what amount of money, what experience, I'm not getting into a plane and breaking Shabbos. Forget it, this is not a test, it's not even a test, it's not hard. But for some people, it is. Okay, so I'm not, you know, Shomer Shabbos, I'm religious, I'm just doing Friday night, I'll go back and I'll do it. Do you understand? So let's switch it a little bit more, a little bit more at home, okay? So imagine, um, you know, you have your children and, you know, maybe you're not davening as much as you should and you're sort of cutting back and you're like, well, because my kids and that's my avoda now and, and now your kids are driving and now you don't have much of an excuse, okay, in terms of, your, your own davening. So then you decide, all right, like once a year, I'm going to, that's it. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to get up 30 minutes early every, every morning, and I'm going to daven. That's it. And I'm going to be all daven and fresh and ready to greet my children in the morning and get them off to school. So the first, after Yom Kippur, the first week, you're getting up. This is beautiful. Morning brachas. Oh, I remember these. All right. And now you're starting to add things, okay? Before you know it, you're, do, you're, 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 you're doing the whole nine yards. And one week goes by, two weeks go by, three weeks, and then your friend calls you up and says to you, you're not going to believe what my husband got me for my birthday. He got me a private fitness instructor. I, I have my own fitness instructor who's going to come every morning. And you can come over. You come over and work out with me. It's not going to cost you anything. And you're like, oh, but you realize this is not going to work. There's no way you're going to be able to do the, all the full davening and you're going to be there for your kids and get them off to school and something's got to give. It's not going to be the kids. For some people, this is a test. And it's easy to rationalize. Oh, you know, I have to take care of my body because it houses my soul. And all the things that you can say and do, and I'm not a man, I don't have to go to Minion, and da 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 all the things. In the end, it's a test. It's hard. What's, when we talk about my will versus God's will, what are we talking about? We're talking about what I feel like doing versus what I want to do. That's Bechira. Free will is not chocolate ice cream, vanilla. I think I'll take chocolate. That's license, that's choice. Free will is when you're choosing the right thing to do versus the wrong thing. You're making a moral decision. What I feel like doing versus what I want to do. I feel like taking advantage and having a private fitness instructor. I want to daven. 
I feel like being a patient, calm mother. I want to yell at my kids right now. I feel like being healthy and watching my diet. But, no, I feel like eating a donut, but I want to be healthy and watch my diet. Do you understand? So you feel like yelling at your children, you feel like eating the donut, you feel like having the fitness instructor, but you want to be a patient mother. You want to be healthy. You want to dive in. Do you understand? So that's the choice. That's the tension. So fill in the mitzvah here. For all of us, it's something different. It might be the, the uh, how tight our skirt is. It might be um, in terms of Lush and Hora and not rationalizing and, 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 oh, but this is for, we're trying to help people, so we'll do a Gallup poll amongst our friends, you know, to talk about that person. You, you, put, you insert it. For everybody, it's different. So what is it? It's my will versus God's will. It's what I feel like doing versus what I want to do. I really want to do what God wants me to do, but I feel like fill in the blank. Got it? All right. So let's review. Let's review. The Almighty sends us tests. Why does he send us tests? Because he loves us. Because he, loves us, because he cares. 90% towards passing the test is just realizing it's a test. It's not that person. It's not that school board. It's not that politician. It's not that, it's not that husband. It's not that mother-in-law. This is between you and the Almighty. That doesn't take the onus off of them that they have to work on themselves and change, but God brought those people into your life for a reason, because he wants you to be a better person. We don't go, grow through our spouse's good qualities. We grow through his challenging qualities. We don't grow through the easy kid. We grow through the challenging kid. That's why God put them in our life, because he wants to squeeze the potential out of us. So 90% is just realizing it's a task. The next 5% is knowing what category it falls under. The next 5% is just putting it into action. So what are the categories? It's G can. G is? Giver versus taker. Okay, you're not going to have your notes with you when, when this happens, okay? And I, I, I apply this all the time because there's always stuff going on. It, there's always things going on that are hard. And you apply it. I'm telling you, the stuff it works like, like magic. All right, giver versus taker. C, connection. connection versus estrangement. Either it's going to be bringing me closer to this person or farther away. There is no neutral choices here, okay? A is? Acceptance, Acceptance versus rejection. And M, my, my will versus God's will. What I feel like doing versus what I really want to do. My bracha to you is that the Almighty should send you easy schmeasy tasks <laughs> and you should grow really grow through the easy tasks and not wait for them to get harder. But when the tests come, whether they're easy or they're hard, you should pass them with flying colors. Thank you, ladies.